point about weekends for me is not that we've got more time for cooking, but we've got more time for eating, and I like to make the sort of food that just gets on with itself slowly in the kitchen, so I can potter about and invite friends for lunch without being chained to the stove. Now this is one of my favourite standbys. It's shoulder of lamb, which is to turn into a shredded warm lamb salad with mint and pomegranate. Now let me just turn the oven on. Let me get ooh, tin out. Turn on the heat. Right, so the lamb gets bunged into the pan to brown. Don't need to add any fat because it's got its own. Lovely. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about shoulder. It's cheaper than leg and not as lean. And I know everyone likes leanness now, but the point is, the flavour is in the fat. So all the fat will seep through into the meat, leaving the flavour there, and then the fat just remains in the water I'm going to braise it in. While that's happening, I could do a bit of light chopping. So I've got four shallots here, but you could use a couple of onions. Just don't bother to peel them, just chop them in half. All I want here is for the flavour of these vegetables to go into the water the lamb's going to be cooked in. Likewise, these garlic cloves, no need to peel them, just press with the side of a knife so all their lovely, juicy flavour runs out. And then the carrot just gives wonderful sweetness. So that's... Now, let me just see. I think this is lovely and brown and ready to come out. And then just tumble the vegetables in the pan, in the fat that the lamb's rendered down, and just bobble them about a bit. And now this will both sizzle and smoke. Don't be alarmed. Add salt. Meat that's under salted is vile, so don't be timid. And then lamb back on, this time with the skin side up. Foil on. And then the wonderful thing about this is it's been just a few minutes preparation and now it just gets whopped in the oven, cook it for five hours at a low heat, 12 to 15 hours at an incredibly low heat, whatever, it's in the oven and you just get on with the weekend. This Turkish delight syllabub goes so well with the lamb, which I think has got about two hours left to go. You can make it much further in advance than this if you want, or you can do it at the last minute. I mean, what I love about this is that it goes with this whole weekend style of cooking, that the pace suits you. That's sugar. Cointreau, a bit of a weakness for this. I mean, I know that Cointreau doesn't sound exactly Turkish delight-like, but I just happen to have some in the house and I hate going out and buying new ingredients every time I want to cook something else. And actually that kind of aromatic oranginess is perfect. But if you've got another liqueur which you um, bought in a fit of bad taste, use that. Right, lemon. I tend to use two lemons in here, but these are so vast, I get enough juice out of one. And I'm using a sieve, which I wouldn't ordinarily do, simply because the whole point about syllabub is that it's smooth and creamy. I don't want any pulp or pips. I mean, this isn't really Turkish Delight, but what it is, it's trying to kind of evoke the sort of aromatic essence without any of that temple aching sweetness and glutinousness. It's like perfumed cream. Now, I want the sugar to dissolve a bit into the Cointreau and lemon juice before I start adding the cream. So, we finish the pouring part and now we are now moving into the whisking. Double cream. Now, although the cream thickens immediately when you pour it into the liqueur, it will thin as you start whisking. 
And I should tell you that it does take ages, I'd say a good seven minutes, possibly more, to, to thicken. That's why I use an electric mixer. I mean, you can use a handheld electric one. Unless you want to have a nervous breakdown, I would advise not doing it by hand. It's a long wait, you see. Now when the cream looks like it's thickening a bit, just sort of soon, we're going to add the orange flower water and rose water, and this is what gives the sort of Turkish delight aroma. And then just leave it to thicken more. It always seems to occupy syllabub, some notional territory between liquid and solid. That looks about right. When I lift the beaters up, only just holds a point and kind of flops over. Perfect. The quick taste. Mm. And now it's just a question of spooning it into the glasses. I like the cream to billow like a sort of alpine heap over the top of the glass. Now, this is so beautiful. Can you see these pistachios I got from a Middle Eastern shop, so they've all been slithered and peeled. Incredibly green. Otherwise, just buy ordinary pistachios and chop them up. Just sprinkle them on top. I mean, frankly, you've got pouring, you've got whisking, you've got sprinkling. I mean, it's not hard to make. And I have to say, not hard at all to eat. The wonderful thing about this pepper and feta salad is that it doesn't need any cooking and it goes very well either as a starter before the lamb or eaten with it. I used to always you know, do that char grilling and skinning myself of peppers but these ones from Spain actually taste exactly as if you'd done them yourself so, you know, the lamb's about to come out of the oven. I can spare the odd two minutes doing this. I really love a few whole blanched almonds. Get Spanish ones if you can as well, because they are better. Final hit of parsley. And that is it. And the lamb has been out of the oven without the foil for about 40 minutes, so should be bearable to the touch. I mean, I have got asbestos hands, but even wimps could manage this. And now, just a question of slicing and shredding it. This is a very good illustration of the fact that so many of the best things coming out of the kitchen are a result of accidents. I first made this because I was doing some slow-cooked lamb with beans, haricot beans, and I burnt them and I wanted to salvage the lamb and so I just came up with this and now I do this a lot and I don't do the one with beans so often. Much better. You could, if you were deft, you know, set about the lamb with a kind of two-fork Chinese waiter crispy duck trick. I, however, might have noticed, am not deft so I just do mauling with a bit of knife work. But the point about this slow cooking is that it makes the lamb so incredibly tender that any way you do it, it's easy falls to pieces. And now I'm going to show you something that could change your life. It's how to get seeds out of a pomegranate without you know, all that really boring winkling out with pins. Pomegranate like so, wooden spoon like so, and then you just thwack. Look at that. Rain down these lovely beads. 
put around the edge for decorative purposes. Now a bit of a squeeze. Now the final touch on real clincher, fresh mint. Mm, just chop this. Mint and pomegranate is a wonderful combination. Egyptian. I mean, how beautiful is that? Oh. And some salt. That's it, you know, the lamb's done, the peppers are done, syllabubs are done. Not one bit of slaving. The Italians do a really delicious salad at Christmas with turkey, chicory and pomegranate seeds. Mm, the Italians like pomegranate too, don't they? Mm -hmm. They do it quite a lot. Oh. <laughs> Syllabus. Wow. Hey. Pistachios. Oh. <laughs> Something bad. Mm. Mm. What is the alcohol? Marsala? No, no. What is it? Pontre. Pontre, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can taste the orange juice. If I tell you that there is such a thing as a lazy Sunday lunch for 12, you are going to have to believe me. This is it, slow cooked aromatic pork with the best crackling you've ever had. The fact that it takes 24 hours to cook shouldn't bother you because, to be frank, for 23 hours and 55 minutes you're doing nothing. The aromatic part is a rub of six cloves of garlic, some grated ginger, the ginger now some chilies I'm using just some crushed you know chili flakes here but if you want to use fresh chili which I often do as well then just do sherry vinegar or whatever vinegar you want vinegar is very good for helping crackling get really crisp and some oil nothing fancy Oh, this is. And now, a mm, bit of late night aromatherapy, followed by massage. Oh, this is just rub over the pork, over the scored skin. I mean, it's a lot of skin to cover, but I like to have, you know, a lot of people around at the weekend, and though it sounds awful. I seem to satisfy my Jewish mother leanings by cooking this quart of a pig, which I get from a farm in Dorset. And you know, so much pork now is bred to have no flavour. This is fabulous. Okay, a final smear. Wipe this gunk off my hands. And now I'm going to stagger over to the oven, okay? This weighs more than my children, I think. Right, so that's in the hottest the oven will go for half an hour, and then all I have to do is turn the oven down, turn the pig over, and good night. I'm not going to lie to you, you do need to peel two kilos of potatoes to make this gratin, but then, unless you're having baked potatoes, then you're going to be peeling potatoes for Sunday lunch anyway. Now, I do my gratin slightly differently. Potato gratins are normally just sliced potatoes in cream or milk, 
in the oven, I find then you just get sort of potato gratin that when you bite into it, it bites back. So I cook the potatoes in a pan on the hob and then just as soon as the pork comes out, blitz it in the oven just to brown on the top, which one means you can do all this if you've got one oven, but also means that everything is that lovely margin blurring softness. Very creamy and delicious. Okay, I'm just gonna put the potatoes sliced like this to my pan and then about 500 mils of double cream. Just need to go to the fridge to get some milk and butter. About the same amount of full fat milk. Now, garlic. Because although potato gratin should be creamy and should be sort of comforting, I, it's quite bland. I like a bit of flavour. If I'm doing this with roast chicken, I sometimes put a stalk of rosemary in. Right. Onion too for flavour, which means that although I'm peeling it, I'm not going to bother to chop it up. I'll just take it out when I pour the potatoes into the baking dish. Salt and pepper needs quite, you know, strong seasoning, I think. Lid on and heat on. This will take half an hour, 40 minutes. So I'm just going to get the pork now to turn it over for its final glorious splitzing. Now, I find the easiest thing is to use gloves. Wow. That is just perfect. Very nice. And I've got another pair. So I'm just going to put this in now to get the crackling really crisp. And I'll put the potatoes in the oven to brown just as I take the pork out to rest. This is the ultimate cosy Sunday lunch pudding. Easy sticky toppy pudding. Start off by melting butter, 175 grams self-raising flour. And what makes this so easy as well is you can just stir everything together just before you sit down to lunch. And although it takes 45 minutes to cook, you wouldn't want to eat pudding in under 45 minutes from sitting down to lunch. 100 grams of dark muscovado sugar, and it's this which gives the kind of intense dark treacliness to both sauce and sponge. Because what this is, is a pudding that is kind of a layer of toothsome golden sponge and a kind of volcanic eruption of dark luscious syrup. Okay, so that's the dry ingredients done. Liquid ingredients start off with full fat milk. One egg, some vanilla, good vanilla, not essence, proper extract. So I mix this in, add the melted butter, just leave some in for greasing that dish, and then I mean, all you do is this. You can't get much simpler. In fact, if you've got children, you could probably get them to do it. Just pour the liquid ingredients into the dry. I'm going to put the kettle on now for the sauce. You need about 200 grams of chopped dates. There's 250 in here, so it's kind of most of a packet. Okay, just grease the bowl.
and spoon the batter in. It looks very shallow when you have got it in there and as if it's never going to stretch to sort of feed people, but it, w it really, really will. I mean, I get about six to eight out of this. If I have any more than eight people, um, I definitely would do two. And I know it sounds like it's a lot, but I'd rather have too much than too little and never knowing the undercated is my kind of mantra in the kitchen. Now the sauce, I mean, even easier. 200 grams this time of the dark muscovado sugar. I mean, it gives you almost a kind of licorice-like darkness and depth. And then a few knobs of butter. And this is what makes the sauce syrupy and sticky, as well as sweet. And of course, the good thing about it being dark muscovado sugar is that although it's sweet, it's not sickly. And then, can't claim to know the scientific principles behind this, but it works and I'm an empiricist. 500 mils of boiling water, which you just pour over. And what happens is, this kind of messy stuff on top, liquid slosh, forms a thick syrupy sauce underneath, and that cake batter now underneath has a, is a wonderfully sort of crusty, chewy sponge. Mm. Mm -hmm. Put it on a baking tray, just put it in a 190 degree oven for about 45 minutes. <laughs> Olivia, yeah. can you give me a hat? <laughs> I just want the crackling off. Yeah. Eat as much as you want as you do it. It's perks. And they get the scratch out. With the oven so hot, I think about five, ten minutes, that's all. And then dive in. Look, crackling. Wow. Can I give you some? Yeah. Need another bite. You need another bite. Oh. I will actually. <laughs> they are brilliant. Why don't you have that, darling? It's easy, it's easy. 